am going to tell you a story. It's a story of Africa. And I will wager it's a story that not many of you have heard. Because it's a story not of war or famine, but a story of hope. A story of a generation of people who thought that they could change the world that they lived in. I know them because they were, among others, my parents. They were the people I grew up among. Their music was High Life Music and Fela Kuti and Miriam Makeba. The men wore narrow ties and dark suits and white cuffs and pointed shoes. The women wore mini skirts and Afro wigs and sometimes African costume, splendid African costumes. Wally Shoyinka called them the Renaissance generation. And this is their story. By the 1940s and 50s, empire had become unaffordable for Britain, and so the British government had decided to unload as many countries as possible. The problem was that they had to fast track these countries to democracy. They hadn't ruled them democratically, of course. This was a case of do as I say, not as I do. They had also not spent particular attention creating a middle class, because middle classes are quite troublesome. So they had to, in a very short number of years, create the people who would lead that, those countries towards a new horizon. I have my first slide. The British Council, well, the British Foreign Office, uh, gave the British Council the job of running a scholarship program. Thousands of Africans were encouraged to sit exams and then given scholarships based on their results. The most successful of those won scholarships to go and study in Britain, primarily in practical things like engineering and medicine. My father, Mohammed Fauna, was one of them. In 1957, he won a scholarship to read medicine at Aberdeen University. The induction process saw the young students leave very often their villages for the first time and go to Freetown, where the British Council put them through an induction process. Very few, if any, had left the country. They certainly hadn't been to Britain before. So this was their first taste of British life and culture. My stepmother, who was also a Renaissance, tells a story of how she how the British Council said that if you went to a person, if you were invited to a British person's house for dinner, you had to learn certain rules. The first one was that you must never sit in the house of the head of the house, in the, in the chair of the head of the household. And to this day, she always asks me when she comes, where are you sitting? Where is Simon sitting? The second thing was not to expect large portions of food, because the British ate very small amounts. And the third was not to expect your host to divvy up what was left over for everybody to take home. <laughs> the way that Britain saw itself was urbane, civilized, a place of culture and high expectations. The young students were shown films made by the colonial office of what to expect in Britain. London, the largest city in the world, has a splendid road service of passenger buses for the millions of people, visitors, shoppers, workers and others, needing quick and comfortable transport from place to place. Not only do the buses bring people into London, they also carry passengers out through less crowded streets to the surrounding countryside. On return journeys, they bring passengers back. There is a regular service to or from the town. Here in the near countryside, two African students studying in London have been enjoying the fields and now have to get back to their studies. A bus is now due. They have just time to catch it. They know that buses run to carefully prepared timetables and are always punctual. People never have long to wait. At regular stopping places along the roads, 
People wait quietly in line. Buses, of course, enter London at different parts. It's well to be sure that you get in one that is going to the part you want to reach. The people enter the bus in an orderly manner, no crowding or pushing out of turn, and the conductor controls everything in a cheerful way. Okay, thanks. There's quite a lot more of that. <laughs> I'll have my next slide. My father went to the next one, the Aberdeen University, to study medicine in 1957. Some of the stories he tells and the others who went through the same experience tell is of arriving in Britain of the first time, of the feeling of cold. None of the Africans had a wardrobe that was in any way equipped to deal with the Scottish temperatures. Another African student who arrived and went to stay in a house full of African students thought that the whole terraced house was one and that his friend had done awfully well since he arrived. And all the African students went to Scotland, found a little difficulty in integrating with the locals, except on one night, which was Burns Night, when suddenly they got dozens and dozens of invitations and people ringing their doorbell at midnight. And anyone who's Scottish in here knows the reason why which is that to see a tall, dark stranger as the first person on Burns Night is to, is to have luck for the year. <laughs> Superstitious natives also used to touch them in the street because touching a black person was supposed to bring luck. For the East Africans, it was the first time they saw that white people could be poor as well as rich. Ngugi Wationgo talked of his time at Leeds University of seeing police on horses chase down protesters. And he said that he saw that the British oppressed not just Africans, but their own. Jack Straw said that the Renaissance, the African students coming to Britain in the 60s, were instrumental in helping with the Race Relations Act of 1967 because they were an articulate middle-class group at university at a time when very few people of color had made it to university and they were able to articulate that experience, the experience of racism. They also learned more about Britain. Almost every African I've spoke to said that they suddenly understood why the British wrote so much about flowers, why flowers were so important to the British. This is a clip of Ngugi Wa Tiongo, who came to Leeds. He's Kenya's greatest writer. He came to Leeds to study English literature, and this is his take on the British and daffodils. Listen carefully. I saw the daffodils for the first time, I think, in Leeds. This took me back to my high school days, when we were doing all those daffodils, the golden daffodils by William Wordsworth, which I never understood this obsession with daffodils and flowers before. Because of course in Kenya, in Africa, flowers, they are there all the year round, so it's not a thing of surprise. In spring, in Leeds, I realized what these flowers that come out of the ground and then sort of uh, vanish so quickly could have had such a big impact on English literary history. And Gugi Wak Tiongo talking about daffodils. I'll have my next slide. Of course, things happened. My next one. And there was fraternization with the locals. This is my parents on their wedding day in April 1961. Um, just a, a week after this, in fact, Sierra Leone became independent as one by one the African countries were. My mother tells the story of my father throwing a cocktail party at the British Council, um, a sherry party. He didn't drink very much. He was a kind of lapsed Muslim. Um, but he got very drunk that night, and on the bus back to the house, he lit cigarettes, six cigarettes, and he was smoking them all at once. And somebody said to him, but Mohammed, you don't even smoke. And he said, well, I'm smoking the smoke of freedom, man. I'm smoking the smoke of freedom. Out of the Renaissance, Britain had hoped to create little Englishmen, people who would govern their countries in this, and who would be loyal to Britain. But instead, they bred um, a group of nationalists. Nationalism, nationalism among the students was fervent in the 1960s. 
those who've spoken about it said it was the first time that they were that close to empire. It was the first time that they saw their countries from the outside. They saw Africa from the outside. They also met students from other parts of the empire, from India and Pakistan. And quickly, my next one. And then, that's me in 1964, shortly before we returned. But meanwhile, in America, and my next slide, meanwhile in America, in the time of the Cold War, America was keen to get on, in, on, in on the act. With the trade unionist Tom Boyer from Kenya, they started the Kennedy Airlift. The one of the first people on the Kennedy Airlift was Barack Obama Sr. So when Barack Obama, and the next slide, became President of the United States, people often commented on his unlikely heritage. And I thought, well, actually, not that unlikely. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of us that came out of this. In 1964, we went home. This is my grandfather, Pa Roque, who was a chief, a paramount chief, and my father on his return. It was a time of great optimism. My father set up a clinic, and it was a time of giants, too. There are wonderful stories told of that time. Wally Shoyinka tells of being sent by the Nigerian government to steal back one of the Benin bronzes that they believed was in the studio of an artist in South America. Two of them were paid to go there. They snuck into the man's house and stole it. They got the bronze back. They were delighted with their triumph. But when they looked on the back of the bronze, they saw the letters BM and realized that they had gone to all that expense and time to steal a British Museum copy. It was a time of great flourishing. All the writers, Ngugi Wationge, Shoyinka, Buti Emicheta, Kamarale, Amadou Kuruma, Amadou Hampateba, came from that period in Africa's history. The rest of the Renaissance went to work in the civil, servants, civil service, in the hospitals, in the schools. And then the dream soured. In Kenya in 1964 and in Ghana, the one-party state was introduced. My father, among others, decided to fight it. In Sierra Leone, it was threatened, so he left his practice as a medical doctor and he joined a political party with the specific aim of defeating the possibility of a one-party state. I'll have my next slide. But these renaissances, these new incumbents, were a threat to those who had taken power in their absence. It was something that the, neither the British Council nor the British authorities foresaw, that in removing all the brightest and best, they would leave a vacuum for others to step into. My father became a politician. They won an election the first time in the history of Africa that an incumbent leader had been overturned through the democratic polls. There was great rejoicing in my house, of course I was only three among others, and then there was a coup and another coup. My father spent most of my childhood as a political prisoner. When they were finally able to take power, he discovered that the man that he had fought to put into the presidency was a, would set about creating a one-party state. He resigned in protest. He was imprisoned. He set up an opposition party which was outlawed overnight. And in 1974, he was arrested. And in a year later, almost to the day, he was executed. The same is true of most of the other renaissances. Wally Shoyinka arrested, exiled, Ngugi arrested, imprisoned, banned, exiled. Barack Obama's father became intensely disillusioned with the inability, as he found it, to get a job in a time of great corruption without paying bribes to the right people. And so it was, again in Shoyinka's words, the Renaissance that never happened. But ever since Obama became president, 
and our unlikely biography became known to the world. When I meet people who come from Africa about my age, I often ask them, did your parents by any chance go on one of those British Council scholarships to Britain? And eight times out of ten, the answer is yes, they did. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, award-winning author. Andrew Rugisara, who set up the Good Africa Coffee Company, brought together a collective of coffee growers, now sell to Tesco and Sainsbury's and Waitrose. Mukoma Wangugi, Ngugi's son, is a writer and political activist, and others whose names you don't know. A friend of mine who gave up her job as a lawyer in Britain to return to Sierra Leone after the war and has been trying to negotiate better trade terms for African countries ever since. I've recreated the lives of the Renaissance in fiction. I think their gift to us was immense. I signed a copy of the book for Ngugi Wationgo, and he said, what are you writing about now? And I said, well, you. And he said, really? And he said, why is that? And I said, because you taught us all that there was another way to live. We grew up believing that it was our duty to change the world.